I want to give you a brief history of the Jocelyns and the castle itself, so you kind of know what to expect when you're walking around from room to room, and then possibly also what kind of questions to ask whoever you think is here to answer them for you. Um, this is the home of George and Sarah Jocelyn and their adopted daughter, Violet. They moved here from Vermont. He made his money in the newspaper business. They said when he got off the train in Iowa, he had $9 in his pocket and just a suitcase full of clothes. However, when he died in 1916, his net worth was $10 million. He was the richest man in Nebraska at that time. They moved into this castle. In 1913, a tornado came through and devastated the grounds and the house itself. Just a little bit on the outside, but more or less the grounds. George wanted to just leave and give up this house and move away, but their daughter Violet had just gotten engaged. So, she just, so like any normal girl, wanted to stay and get married in the castle. So she ended up getting married later that year. The following year, had two twin girls um, named them after her mother, Sarah, and one Jocelyn. After that, she moved away with her husband. George passed away in the house in 1916, just three years after the tornado. They said he was devastated from the, um, the devastation that it took on the greenhouse and the palm house outside. So only after three years, he passed away. Sarah lived a little bit longer. Um, George passed away in 1916. She lived until 1940. So she um, stayed in the house much longer after that. In fact, took on a little bit of the newspaper business herself after he passed away. And then she passed away in 1940. After that, the house sat vacant for four years. Um, there was no endowment left to it. Her only wishes was that no other family move into the house. She did not want this to be used for, as a single family house again, but rather for the community. So that's why we hold events like this. Um, her second wish was that no one touched any of the woodwork of the house. They spent so much money on this house. Um, it was built from 1902 till 1903 in just 11 months, and it cost them $250,000, making it worth $6 million today. So her other wish was that no one touched the woodwork because in many of the rooms, it's different wood from around the world, not just the United States, but we have Spanish mahogany from Cuba. We have Circassian walnut that was near the Black Sea, which is now the Republic of Georgia. Everything now is just very precious and we like to respect it. Um, so basically after the house sat vacant for four years, OPS moved in because the state did not want to take over because it was a lot of money to protect the outside and the inside of the house. So OPS moved in for 45 years and made this their home office. They did do some changes to the castle, however. Um, they moved in their offices from the basement all the way up into the third floor. So they took out um, some of George's prized possessions in the basement. They took out some of the bathrooms. Um, they did a lot of changes so that it could make their life easier. But if we weren't for them moving in, we not, may not be in this castle today. After OPS grew big, too big for the castle, then it turned over to Johnson Castle Trust, who we are today. So we are here to maintain and preserve the integrity and dignity of the house and also the grounds. So we're pleased to have Brian and his group here because many of you we may not see on a daily basis or for our Sunday tour group. So we're glad that we could bring you on tonight um, to introduce you to the Johnson Castle. I'm here with you a great evening. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian and he's going to continue this. Thank you. Good evening. 68% of the world population believes in some form of an afterlife. 90% of the world's religions believe in some form of an afterlife. Yet, only 42% of the people who do believe in an afterlife believe in ghosts. Why is that? We've been to call, told that ghosts don't exist, that ghosts are a fairy tale. Ghosts are a figment of our imagination, yet none of us stop and ask ourselves, where did this information come from? Was this information based on facts or opinion? Were those facts based on outdated research or strictly in belief? Was the research being conducted under biased pretenses? Or is it our own fear of the unknown which guides our conclusions? Scientists once believed the Earth was the center of the universe. Scientists once proclaimed the Earth was flat. At one time, scientific speculation was actually persuaded by religious organizations. 
Yet over the centuries, scientists around the world have long debated the existence of ghosts in an afterlife. There are those who take Einstein's law of conservative energy literally, who believe the energy existing in our bodies cannot be destroyed, but is merely transformed. And there are those who believe that the bioenergy cannot exist outside of its bodily limitations. One side believes that our Earth's electromagnetic field is capable of absorbing our conscious energy, therefore maintaining the Earth's energy as a constant, while others believe our energy simply dissipates upon our death. There are skeptics who allow their own agendas to guide their sentiment. Like those who have a firm belief in an afterlife, there are those who have no religious affiliation or impressions who choose to cast aside any notions which may contradict their opinions of death, one which is final and absolute. <clears throat> Some of us choose to guide our beliefs based on our own fears of the unknown. Fear is a very powerful emotion, one that can be our ally, but also one that can detract us away from the truth. Since most experiences and occurrences are startling, our fears take over, causing us to instantly imagine a worst-case scenario. To counteract this, we convince ourselves our minds are playing tricks on us and there must be a rational reason for the occurrence. Some of us have been told that ghosts are evil. Some religions go as far as to say ghosts are demonic in nature. That these lost souls deserve to be and should be left alone. Yet some religions want us to embrace a Holy Ghost and to marvel at one man's resurrection, one in which he appeared in apparitional form for 40 days. Time and time again we've been tricked by phony mediums and psychics, misinformed by so-called ghost hunters who present false evidence. We are deceived by Hollywood's elaborate depictions of actual hauntings. Most recently, movies involving a demonic doll, Ouija boards, and the devil involved in a murder case. The contradictions are numerous and vary from one end of the spectrum to the other. It is no wonder less than half of the world's population has trouble grasping the concept of ghosts. It appears that our deception, contradiction, and our own fears cause 68% of us to take the safe route and to turn our backs on what may be the truth. Master illusionist Harry Houdini dedicated the last years of his life searching for that truth. He was willing to put up a staggering $10,000 to anyone who could provide the definitive proof of an afterlife. Why? During performance with a gun horribly wrong in the Detroit River, Harry had a near-death experience, one in which he claimed to have witnessed his dead mother's appearance and hearing her voice, which allegedly led him to safety. This one experience alone influenced his beliefs and was the driving force behind his search for answers. However, Harry was not easily convinced. His agnostic search for the absolute truth unfortunately ended upon his death, death never discovering that truth. But he managed to debunk and call out many fake psychics, fake mediums, and so-called ghost hunters providing a great service in his day. Although his search came up empty-handed, his dedication to discovering the existence of an afterlife never wavered. Personally, I would have liked to have Harry on our team. Like Houdin, Paracon also applies an agnostic approach to our investigations. By maintaining a neutral perspective, Paracon does not believe any structure is haunted until proven otherwise. 
We believe a location needs to prove itself by providing legitimate evidence to the contrary. Evidence in the form of unexplained irregular environmental readings, unexplained verbal responses captured on voice recorders, and unexplained visual appearances captured in photos or in video surveillance. Once evidence of this kind is captured, it is scrutinized which, with attempts made to recreate the situation if necessary. Sometimes we are able to debunk what appears to be an anomaly rather easily, but there are times when we are, we are left with scratching our heads. But this is all part of the process in discovering actual paranormal activity. After all, we are looking for the real thing. So let's ask ourselves, what do we believe? Are our beliefs influenced by others' perceptions? Or are they based on personal experience? Are we being open-minded and truly agnostic? Or are we being closed-minded and overly skeptical? Are we afraid of being mocked? Or are we afraid of the truth, whatever it may be? Are we, are we here tonight simply out of curiosity? Because it's close to Halloween? Are we facing our fears? Or are we looking for answers? Since the absolute truth affects us all, I have to believe deep down each and every one of us would prefer to know if there is an afterlife and if possible, what's next. I also believe that each and every one of you would love nothing more than to have a first-hand experience tonight. I cannot guarantee you, I cannot guarantee you this will happen this evening, but it is our intention to provide all of you with the multiple facets of legitimate paranormal investigation in a building which we believe has considerable signs of activity. So some of you may be asking why Joslin Castle? The answer starts with the numerous claims made over the years. The non-existent bride walking down the stairs. Voices being heard in the ballroom. Dark masses passing through some of the volunteers. Strange breezes and the numerous accounts of being watched in Sarah's bedroom. To skeptics, these occurrences should be written off as an act of imagination due to the age and appearance of the castle. But to investigators, these occurrences may be a telltale sign of actual activity. The old adage, if it acts like a ghost, talks like a ghost, there may be a ghost in there somewhere, applies when attempting to find legitimate locations conduct research. This is why Jocelyn Castle became a prime candidate for these classes. I want you all tonight to be aware of your surroundings at all times. Make mental notes of each room's layout. Be cognizant of anyone carrying on quiet conversations or whispering. Where people in your group are located and where they're moving to. And most of all, follow the general rules of the investigation especially during EVP sessions. There is a slight possibility you may have a personal experience this evening. We ask that you do not overreact. It does, if this does happen, we ask that you calmly announce this to your group leader so that we may further investigate the situation. If you need to take a break, we encourage you to take the seat, gather yourself, or quietly exit the castle through the front door. And finally, unlike the movies and TV shows, 95% of all actual paranormal events are very, very subtle. It is highly unlikely you will see anything floating through the air tonight or doors slamming shut. Rest assured, you are in no danger while in the castle. We want you to relax, enjoy the evening, let go of your previous notions, and open your mind to the possibilities. In closing, we want to thank each and every one of you for your contributions this evening. The money raised for the, from these public classes goes directly to the Joslin Castle Foundation to, <clears throat> to assist in the restoration of this beautiful Omaha landmark and the Team Paracon for further research in its paranormal studies. Would you please give yourselves a round of applause? Before I bring up our next speaker, Sherry Moore, would you please come forward? <laughs>
Error time. Do the evidence be collected? And a lot of the uh, claims and experiences that we've had here in the past of the last four trips we've been in here, the team is very uh, secure in operating Joslyn Castle a certification of actual haunting. This goes to your wow. staff. Thank you. <laughs> So we're thrilled to be sharing this with these visitors and then other visitors that may come up when you investigate the footage later. So thank you very much. <laughs>
notice there's no footsteps. to make anyone a believer, okay? We're not going to force an opinion on you whatsoever. We're just merely going to point out your irregularities in the environment, primarily in the electromagnetic field, in room temperature, and in the air ion count. A formal house inspection has already been conducted by Team Paragon. All in-house in wiring electronics are up to code and should not affect any of our EMS data collection devices. Therefore, any stray and moving changes in the atmosphere could be a precursor of activity. If you want to be a team player and want to capture these uh, in anomalies, we ask that all cell phones be shut off during the investigation process, since some cell phones can actually, in close proximity, to affect our meters. It will actually set off. So there will be plenty of time to take photos over the course of the evening. Now I did find out tonight that you can put your phone in airplane mode. It shuts off all the data where you can take pictures and maybe use your uh, ghost apps if you have one of those on your phone. Just for fun. So if you don't have any of that kind of stuff, just shut it off. All right. We will be doing real-time EVP sessions in about in 10 or to 15 minute increments. After that, we're going to review them as a group. Each group is going to do their own immediately after that session. We encourage each and every one of you to be involved in this process. However, there are rules to be conducting an EVP session. Number one, no whispering. Whispering actually comes across uh, EVPs come across as whispers, so uh, it's a good thing not to do that at all. Just talk in a normal voice if you have something to say. Rule number two, keep your chatter amongst your friends to a bare minimum. Uh, basically, the last time I had a class here, recorded uh, two women discussing another woman's clothing choice. Okay. 
Lawyer <laughs> brothers are very sensitive. You might think they're talking quiet, but I was like on wow. We're talking ghosts and they're talking about clothing. Uh, number, rule number three is to keep your questions short and to the point. We want to capture their responses, not a long narrative. Number four, during an EVP session, oops. Please sit down or stand still. Basically, the floors of the castle will creak a lot and can interfere with that. Be very loud. And rule number five, when asking questions during an EDP session, we ask you to be respectful to the individuals that reside here. Uh, this is still their house, and you are in there, you're the visitors. So please refrain, refrain from provoking or slanderous comments in order to get a reaction. Please stay with your group at all times. If you must leave to use the restroom for any reason, just please let one of the lead investigators know. And we ask that you do not touch items that belong to the castle. Everything that is in the castle has been donated, so we ask that you respect these gracious donations. Once we have completed the investigations for the evening, we will all adjourn to the back here in the music room for a final briefing and brief questions and answer period. If you wish to leave us your email addresses, please fill in the email sheet in the music room and any information that we catch here, we can send that to you via email. Again, we want to thank you for your contribution this evening and I want to wish you all a good hunt tonight. Thank you very much. Now, anybody have any questions? We're going to do a little question and answer period right now. Anybody have any questions about anything? Go ahead. Is there any chance that, I mean, besides like Sarah or George coming through, that someone else that has, has passed already can come through to a person here? Yeah, Not quite understand what you mean. Do you think a dead person can open a door? No, no. I mean, can they somehow communicate with somebody? Like Who would, would say, so, my, my grandma died right. communicate me here? Yeah, no. just because we're in an open mind, we have an open mind here. And it's Quite possibly, you know, I don't know how strong the entity that does reside here is. Maybe he don't want anybody else That's here. So, uh, we, again, this is all still research and study. We're trying to understand it right now, primarily with, with the scientific side of paranormal research, primarily going after the electromagnetic field in this sense, just trying to make sure we're getting the right readings. Is, game, is the first stage of this. From there on, absolutely. If we can start getting answers on what it's like over there, what's the game plan or, or the rule, maybe there are rules on that other side. I don't know. But uh, it'd be kind of nice if Grandma showed up for you. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. There's some, what was the history that we're still researching on whether or not there was a family cemetery on this ground? Oh, sure. Uh, when the Jocelyns bought this land, it was owned by the Sutton um, family. They had a farm on this land. So many people um, have tried to uncover that they think the Suttons are actually buried on this land and that the castle was built on top of that family cemetery. Um, the last name is S-U-T-P-H-E-N. Sutton is the last name, so you can even um, ask them a couple questions tonight if you think about it. Yeah. It's an emotional attachment on my offer. To Either that, I, I would think that, you know, we, we had this discussion this afternoon, didn't we? And if you think about it, the man's put, put a lot of money in this place. He built this for his wife, basically. I mean, the grounds, that's her turf too, you know. So who it is, we're not sure, but just her two male, I mean, right. two EVPs of a male. I lived in a house that had a spirit. What I'm getting at is, is he could put that much effort into this and this with his baby, and technically they are the only people. This family, that was the only family that actually lived in this house. After that it was, 
don't want public schools, and it bounced right back into what you're standing in now. But I can understand how they would be attached to this house, but if there's no evidence as to why this spirit would be attached to the house, how would that spirit? Again, I don't know the rules on that other side, but <laughs> if I was to guess, if I was to guess, I mean, I, I run into quite a few entities where they actually believe that's still their property. Uh, I lived in a house like that uh, for nine years, and when we went to actually get to, to, to get to investigate it, his comment directly to me, my brother, was it's the old man's house, it's not your home. That kind of mentality, I think, is what drives a lot of it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I mean, that's why I think that this could quite possibly be George. <laughs> I'm going to try and make amends. So my group, you're going to, for a while there, we're going to be trying to, Brian will be trying to offer peace off. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Questions? Can you say the history of your group and how did you guys all come together? Marathon? Yeah. Uh, I started it in 2007. I was a performer in a band and I came across a couple of drunks one night <laughs> trying to, and I lived in a haunted house when I was younger. And the one guy said that he wasn't going to go into his grandma's house anymore because stuff was going on there. And I got to thinking, boy, oh, yeah, this might be my chance to try this. So I took a voice recorder, I borrowed a K2 meter, and I took a camcorder. That's all I had. And I went out there, and I actually was able to debunk everything that he had going on. And he went back and finished working on his grandma's house. But that hooked me right there. And so then I got a hold of everybody that's on the team. Everybody has had experiences. Ryan, Lisa, Alan, uh, and David. And um, so where we were, uh, from there, we just started buying equipment little by little. Uh, if you guys are wondering what we're going to be doing with the money, I'm sure you all have seen um, ghost hunters and ghost adventures where they use a FLIR thermal imaging camera. This is what we're working for tonight, is uh, so we can get our flare, uh, which gives us the exact measurements as far as heat signatures, cold signatures, but it's cold spots, and that can actually give us an image of that. I would have loved that mass that we you just saw on here. I would have loved to have a thermal uh, image of that exact same mass. And I think on the October 3rd of this year, when we the class before this one, when Dave and I saw that uh, mass up in the ballroom, that thing was moving. And what was odd, uh, when I get my group up there, I'll just explain it to everybody. Last time we were up there, Dave and I were up there, we had a group. We saw the mass, it dissipated. I asked Dave to start taking pictures. Dave started taking pictures. As he's panning across the room, there's, you can see some furniture there. You can see a trash can along the wall. It's a little short trash can. Trash can was in that shot. Trash can was in that shot. Next shot, trash can's gone. It's being blocked by something. Next shot, the trash can's there. A minute or two later, one of my students who was in my group caught an 8.1, me reading on the mail meter. And as soon as she caught that, another student heard footsteps going up the North uh, Tower tour, uh, tour steps. So it was all bang, bang, bang. So something unusual was happening along that one wall at that point. So. Well, my students caught what was like below half the right. aboriginal legs. The ballroom is really rigged up sure. right now. He's got a ton of <laughs> equipment. Second floor too, where the black, where that black dark mass was caught. So that was not a shadow; that was a dark mass. There was you couldn't see through it. And what's odd, what I was trying to explain in the video there, is that Doreen was just doing stock photos that night. She was just sitting there clicking along because we like to get photos of much of the, of the inside of the castle. So when we're trying to debunk something, then we can say, well, there's a window right there. Maybe a headlight came through and caused that to happen, or whatever. And as she was doing that, she was in the complete dark. But it, it looks like something is reaching around like this from behind her and trying to blur her picture, like somebody would be trying to 
block your camera if you're sitting there taking pictures, you know, somebody <coughs> in funny man or whatever. Anybody else? Ask questions. Let's do it. You guys ready to hunt tonight? Yes. yes. All right. How many of you have something that you can't explain that's the brought you? Yeah. So we got one, two, three. No, I didn't invest it. <laughs> Yeah, where are my skeptics? Come on! <laughs> Give me one! <laughs> yeah, they're involved. I don't know if they exist as personal personalities, I, but I do believe there's things that we don't understand. I want to be convinced. And, and that is a great agnostic yeah. way of looking at things. I mean, I don't know if that's George who we just heard. All I know is that's a voice that don't belong to anybody that was there at the time. That that image. We tried to debunk it. We tried to recreate it. We were throwing things in front of the camera. We were sticking our fingers in front of the lenses. We were doing all sorts of stuff. We were trying to block some of the light to see if that would do it. We could not recreate it. But that's exactly the way we think when we go to a private residential home. Maybe that's something I should cover. Paracon was made for a family like when I was little. I, I wish it would have been around when I was a little boy. And private investigations, residential information, like going to death house, for instance, that gives us more joy than going and doing, you know, I realize a lot of you know that I was on TV a lot in a lot of radio interviews. That's the side of the point. I only do that for awareness because I know there's a lot of people out there that are living in homes that they're going, really? And, and, and I know what that feels like. I know personally what that feels like. And I, when we go into a new investigation, like I said, we go in agnostically and we go into the neutral perspective because that's what they are expecting from us. They are expecting us to give them the truth. And if we can't give them that truth, then we have to keep going back in and keep going back in until we find what's really going on. And not every place is haunted. That, you know, we're fortunate that Joslyn Castle allowed us to come in here and investigate. The first time we came in, we came in with, well, it could be, it's, it's really cool looking and this and that, but then we actually caught stuff. And it's kind of like, this would be a great class, a great, cl great class to stretch out, give people something to look forward to, something that they can learn from, and that's the whole idea tonight. I want you all to learn what's really going on. Is this TV crap? And what you see in the movies, it ain't what it really is. This is not an exploitation of George and Sarah's house. We're here to be respectful. We're here to talk to them. So I expect that from you tonight. If you're going to ask a question, ask it and talk just like I'm talking now. Don't be scared to ask. If you're too scared to ask, don't ask it. There's no reason to be frightened. But back to the private residential. When people contact us to do a paranormal, paranormal investigation, we go in, we try to debunk all of their claims. That's the first thing we try to do. Oh, you're seeing shadows? Alan, where's the window at? Is there a possibility cars cause it? The headlight infiltration is causing that? Oh, you got banging? Dave, check them pipes. Are they rattling around in there? What happens when the dishwasher kicks on? Change your water pressure. You hear a bunch of ticking in the middle of the night? Hmm. How cold is it in the house? Are you turn it on the heat? The ductwork clicking? This is the first thing we all uh, we try to do is to, to debunk every one of their claims because you know what? That eases their mind. It eases their mind to know it's something that's rational and man-made. But if we go through all those claims. If we start getting voices like you just heard, we're getting weird pictures like you just saw, then we change it into a paranormal investigation. That's why Paracon doesn't have paranormal investigation. It's just Paracon investigations. That's paranormal reconnaissance and exploration. But we investigate first. We want to find the truth. That 
make sense? Okay. Any other questions? So let's go on the best house. Pardon? <laughs>
I said we're trying to do this scientifically, and I don't mean no disrespect, but that could possibly be just be anything popping up on there. And if it's going off of EMF, the K2 meter, believe it or not, is susceptible to cell phone. That's why Alan asked you not to turn on your cell phones tonight. And uh, what else? Oh, and radio broadcast. So the only people carrying walkie-talkies tonight will be your four group leaders, and the only time we're going to be broadcasting anything is when we're going to be doing our switches. Go ahead and show them real quick. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Your yeah. cell phone will do the same thing. If you get a text message or a, a notification of some sort, we'll set these off. So we don't want to have any those kind of things interfering tonight. So the only time we're going to use our hockeys is when it's time to do the Talking place. about ghost hunters. Now, I like Jason and Grant, don't get me wrong. They're a lot more respectful than that. The three stooges on Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> but how many times did you see this? So are you in the location? Are you a man or a woman? You, you following me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how, how, how cool, how hard would it have been to learn that? Yeah. And all you guys see is this thing going off on the camera while some cameraman's over here answering questions for you. Okay? Are we going to have interference with the groups? Like if we hear footsteps, could it be one of the other groups? No. What we're going to be doing tonight, as Alan said, once we get to EVP sessions, I want everybody to stand still or sit down. Uh, you know, the floor's creaking, just in yeah. there. <laughs> and believe me, if, if you guys had to listen to the audio of the headphones, all you hear is, I'm asking serious questions, you know, you get a little exasperated, especially when you get what we already got out of here. I mean, listen to that. They just called out her name, we think, and that's Elizabeth right there. <laughs> Obviously, I'm Brian. Uh, any other questions? For those of you yes, sir. One. Um, you mentioned the different woodwork from all over the world and everything like that. Do you know what sort of stone that was used Kansas to live on the outside? Five stone from Kansas. Okay. And it's very thick, so it kills your cell phone batteries, so you might as well turn your phone off. For those of you who are living in situations or are dealing with paranormal experiences, I would like to offer a suggestion. The reason I came to Paracon, I was with another team, and my daughter was living, and I, I lived in a house that had extreme activity. I thought I was going crazy, really did. I thought I was losing my mind until, like you said, the person went in after me and called me within a month and a half and reported every single thing I was experiencing. Um, things that were just not normal. Um, didn't have anything again that my daughter and her daughter were having some pretty intense experiences. And I went in with my team expecting that we were going to debunk everything. And that's not what happened. Uh, I came back with voices and uh, masses and things that were definitely happening. At that point, I become mom and grandma. And I'm not objective enough to become the person dealing with the situation, which is when I contacted Brian. I said, I need another team to come in and, and deal with this now because I'm too close. So well, the last thing I want anyone to do is don't go home and buy a bunch of meters and a bunch of voice recorders and go into your own home and try to conduct investigations um, because you're too close to the situation. Respectable teams do not charge for their services. If you're in a situation where you're feeling afraid, and you need help, that's what we're here for, is to help you through that. I have seen people become obsessed yep. with investigating their own home. You're also inviting whatever that entity is to communicate with you. And there are ways you can communicate. If something's going on, your mom said, knock me off, stop. This is my home. I live here. I pay the rent. That's one thing. But to be sitting with the voice recorder and saying, talk to me, talk to me, bang on the wall, do something, I would encourage you not to do that in your own home. Because you have to live with it. You have to live with it. So, um, and, I, and I've seen people do that when they go out and buy tons of equipment, because it's easy to do. You can go on Amazon and the internet and both places. But, it, you know, call a team. Call us. We'll, we'll help you through those situations, other than putting yourself in the position of being the one that's trying to, you know, and we don't.
don't just come in and investigate and say, oh, here's the evidence and leave. We're going to help you deal with the situation, whether that's, you know, we'll help you wash your house, house, we'll help you set parameters to be able to set limits and say, okay, you know, the old man's home is not your house. Well, okay, how can we live here together then? What can we do? How can, you know, we're not just going to walk in and, and stir things up and leave you with, with the mess that you have to deal with afterwards, too. So, No, I'm just standing. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it was it was me. I was just I was wondering if um you said there was a school. Has there been any like like journals or somebody's written down experiences that they've had here in the castle that you know of? Marty, Corsaro, and Rob used to be. What were they, Sherry? Like caretakers, kind of. They were docents. Huh? They were docents, so they were just tour guides. All right. Marty, I think, had the worst one, and we'll be going up there tonight. Matter of fact, we got a camera trained on that area tonight. Um, she was sitting, kind of Indian style, on the floor. And her husband was up in the uh, butler's quarters. And Marty was sitting right in front uh, of the door. And she witnessed a dark mass approaching her. It was about this high off the ground. Now, here we get, we're talking about dark masses, not shadows. And she claimed this dark mass moved towards her. She could actually feel the wind across her clothing and pat like it passed through her. It was disturbing enough that Marnie had to leave the building. Um, we don't know what that would be, but we've actually caught dark masses in here. I just saw another one up in the ballroom, ironically, again last week. So personal experiences are nice. We'd rather catch them on because that's, to me, is the hard evidence. That's what we present to Sherry and Lou. Uh, and other than that, it's just a personal experience. It's cool. I mean, talk about it. But and then Rob was on the second floor landing and was just taking pictures, and he's the one that caught that picture of the woman in the blue dress. And it looks like a person standing there, doesn't it? Have you, have you seen that on the, on the website or on the, the news broadcast on KPTM? That's what Rob caught. Brian, you have K2 activity going on when you're talking about the, the dress, everything you've brought up that K2 is going on. Every time you brought up something, it was going on. So you got your walkie-talkies on? Anybody got a cell phone? Mine's off. Mine's off. Okay. You talked about the Now, the rest on the stairs. one thing, uh, okay. each of you were handed a little piece of paper with a letter on it. That's your group tonight. Group A will be with Alan. Group B will be with me. Group C will be with Lisa, and Group D will be up there with David. We have a schedule tonight. We're going to try to keep this to 35 or 40 minutes at each stop. These are the four hot spots we consider for the castle. So, uh, after we're going to take a short break here. I'm going to go have a cigarette real quick. And, uh, I'm come in. and uh, I'm going to come in. And if anybody would like to get a book or whatever, I'm going to go over to the table there. Uh, you guys want to pick one up and then I'll sign it for you, whatever. And then um, after that, we're going to get started. So let's meet. What time you got? Uh, yeah, what time you got? Uh, yeah, 8.05. Pardon? 8.05. 8 let's meet back here in about 10, 15 minutes. I can make it 15, 20 minutes. Okay? 15 minutes.